why don't we uh, get this ball rolling? Um, could I start by asking for a note-taking volunteer? If anybody would be so kind. Yeah, sure, I can do that. Thank you, Turk. A true Calico hero. Um, so I think we're going to start it off just by doing a quick rundown on uh, on recent and upcoming releases. Um, so I can get that started just by going over um, Calico 313 status. So uh, we released Calico 3.13.0, uh, I guess, about a month ago. Um, that uh, we, we spoke about that a bit in the last meeting in terms of features there. Um, the main one is the uh, tech preview of the eBPF data plane. Um, since then, there hasn't been a whole lot of activity on 3.13. We've done two patch releases with, with minor fixes. Um, one in the eBPF uh, data plane tech preview, and another was just a base image update um, to pull in the latest uh, packages and dependencies. Um, I think there are a few bug fixes that we're going to talk about a little bit later in the meeting that uh, will likely show up in a 3.13 patch release. Um, but other than that, it's, uh, it's looking fairly good. Uh, Spike, do you want to talk a little bit about 3.14? Yeah, so we're um, approaching a 3.14 uh, release um, and features that are slated to go into that. Um, one is uh, we have added um, to our, our Kubernetes controllers uh, the ability to automatically generate host endpoints um, based on the nodes that are in your cluster. So. If you're auto scaling your cluster um, and you want to use host endpoints to um, enforce policy on uh, processes that are actually running on the host or in the host namespace, um, this uh, will help you there. Um, this creates uh, what we call wild carded um, interfaced ho host endpoints. So um, host endpoints can either target a specific interface on a uh, host, or they can have a wildcard and they target all interfaces, including all the interfaces that talk out to the external network and interfaces that talk to um, pods that are running on, on that node. Um, this auto host endpoint creates uh, the latter, these wildcard interfaces. So it doesn't matter which interface um, traffic is coming in, the policy that you apply to that that wildcard host endpoint applies. Um, and that sort of uh, plays into the, the second uh, major feature is um, we've added support for um, applying normal policy to these wildcarded um, host endpoints. In previous releases of Calico, wildcarded host endpoints only supported pre-DNAT policy. Um, the idea there was it was primarily about protecting um, node ports, um, which, which you need pre-DNAT policy for, uh, but now you can use any kind of policy and, and so you can um, protect processes that are running um, on, uh, on the host or in, in the host uh, network namespace. Um, so those, those uh, two things kind of go hand in hand and they're coming in. I think Lawrence is going to give us a demo um, of that a little bit later. Um, the other really big one um, is encryption support. So to Calico Open Source, we're adding um, the uh, adding support for uh, doing host-to-host -host encryption, which is transparent to the pods. So the pods don't even need to know anything is going on. But every packet that gets sent out on the wire by Calico uh, gets encrypted. Um, and we're using um, uh, blanking on the name of it now. Uh, WireGuard. Wire WireGuard. There we go. Yeah, uh, we're using WireGuard uh, as the uh, encryption. Um, uh, protocol and that is a a new very modern um, protocol suite um, that is designed for simplicity and speed um, so it uses cha cha poly um, and elliptic curve uh, for the authentication um, and is kind of nicely nicely wrapped up nice small attack surface um, and very fast compared to the kind of bloated thing that is ike and um, uh, uh, or, IPsec uh, protocol suites. Um, so that'll uh, be going in as well. 
Um, the other uh, thing that we want, or one other thing we want to mention, this isn't a, a sort of public facing feature so much as a developer feature. Um, we've added a nice well-defined interface uh, for the CNI plugin to the data plane. Um, in, in Felix, if anybody's uh, poked around the code there, there is um, a, a nice abstract interface between all of the stuff that Felix is doing, calculating what should be done on the data plane, and the code that actually makes that happen um, on uh, the host kernel. Um, so for example, we have Linux uh, code in there um, in open source, but you know, there also exist versions that, that can run on Windows um, and uh, ones that can just send stuff over, over, over protobufs to other things. Um, but the CNI plugin uh, was not designed in, in this way to have this nice clean interface, um, but we uh, have had a community contribution to get in a nice clean interface in the CNI plugin. So now the data plane can be fully pluggable. You can have the CNI plugin running and Felix running um, and basically swap out the data plane for something else. So um, one of the projects that we know about that, um, that actually did this work and um, is excited to be using it um, are some people working on a VPP uh, data plane, which is a user space data plane on Linux. Um, so they'll have, um, you know, their own custom stuff running in Felix and running in the CNI plugin. Um, and this allows them to, to do that without forking Calico and kind of getting all the, the um, updates that are that are going on in, in mainline Calico. So we're really uh, excited about that. Um, and also speaking of data planes, um, 314 is going to include some um, additional uh, EPPF uh, data plane improvements. Kind of high level um, things worth pointing out are ICMP handling um, has been greatly improved so that we correctly um, route ICMP uh, packets back to, to where they should be going. So that should, should handle a lot um, of the uh, kind of error and edge cases a lot more gracefully um, and also uh, support for CNIs other than Calico. Um, so in the original tech release, you had to be using the Calico CNI plugin, whereas with, with the other more normal Calico data plane, you can run Calico in policy only mode on top of like the AWS CNI and things like that. And so we're improving support there. So um, I'm not sure exactly which ones uh, we'll be shipping, but we are adding that, that kind of feature parity. So you'll be able to run the EPPF data plane um, as policy only mode. And that's all I have. Very cool. Thank you, Spike. That, uh, that's a lot of stuff. It's a very yeah. thorough rundown. <laughs> um, and, and like Spike said, I think uh, Lawrence will be doing a, a quick demo of the auto host endpoint stuff um, a little bit later in the meeting. Um, let's see. Uh, so I want to talk about a couple um, hot issues or issues that have uh, been been at the forefront recently. Um, so, uh, and, and this is a, an opportunity for anybody to, to raise um, to our attention issues that you think should, uh, should be made, made more visible to the community or, or that um, you'd like to, to draw attention to. Uh, so I'll just open the, open the floor for anybody who has issues they'd like to talk about. I have one to get us started. Uh, so we mentioned briefly last time that we were looking at some uh, IPAM uh, bug reports that we had seen. Um, there was a a sort of known issue from that we found in, in code reading that we weren't really sure if uh, was being hit, but we thought we would close down where we could uh, potentially leak tunnel IP addresses. Um, and in the process of fixing that, we found another issue uh, that we were able to determine was being hit. Um, we were definitely leaking tunnel IP addresses. Um, we've done uh, a handful of PRs in that area to kind of shore that up. Um, and those have all gone in now. Uh, and so specifically, I'm talking about GitHub issue 1195 here in the Calico repo. Um, so it's kind of a multi-pronged fix to that and various uh, 
parts of the fix that have gone into different releases. So um, we've got the, that in Calico 3.12.1. Um, part of that fix went into 3.13.2 and uh, also will be in 3.14 when it, when it comes out um, in the near future. Uh, so just wanted to follow up on that one from last meeting because I know we, we said we were starting on it. Um, but it should be done now. Any other hot issues? I have another one if nobody else does. Um, so, uh, 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 Tommaso Pizzetti had reported um, an issue about using v VXLAN with cross subnet. Felix doesn't push all of the doesn't push all of the routes out to the data plane. Yes, um, that's a good call out. So I think uh, there's some work going on in that area. Um, so I know Raphael was working on a fix and Sean, who's also on the call, had a, another bit of work in that area that, that may also fix that. I don't know if either of you guys want to talk about it a little bit. Yeah, I think so. So I, I was reworking that area for 314 for some of the, um, uh, BPF work. Um, so I think, I think my rework fixes the issue as a kind of side benefit, um, but that's not appropriate to port back to, to backport to fix existing releases. Um, and I think Raphael was working on um, was working on a patch before I started that should be appropriate to backport to um, uh, to the previous releases. So I think I think that's where we should go with that. Um, take uh, uh, my fix in three fourteen, but also use. Raphael's fix to, to backport to the um, 3.13 and, and whatever other releases we want to backport it to. Yeah, if I recall correctly, this is like a bit of a race condition in, in the ordering of updates we received from, from the data store where our code wasn't resilient to a certain ordering and we, we wouldn't program some routes. Yeah, so if, if you get like, if you get the right ordering, then it all comes through and, and obviously I'll test put things in in the right ordering. Um, whereas if you get, if you happen to get it in the reverse ordering, then it wouldn't trigger. Yeah, exactly. And I think it only affects cross subnet mode. So if you're um, using VXLAN encapsulation, always, then I think you're not affected by this. But I could be wrong. That was my recollection. Yes, sir, I guess I meant to bring that up. My my DNS is flaking out. Um, yeah, it's only on cross that mode. Um, There's also a, another issue uh, that I'm going to start working this week with um, too many get calls getting issued by Typha. Um, I know Spike has done some investigation or a little bit of investigation on it, but I'm barely getting to it at this point. Uh, so the scalability issue that I think someone from Google brought up. Yeah, um, that was uh, Jacek uh, Kenyak brought that issue to us. Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. Um, I don't think we we know yet what the root cause of it is, but. Um, yeah, Typha appears to be from the API server logs doing lots of get requests when it should be doing watches. I know we have some like resiliency code in the syncer to, to fall back to gets when watches aren't working or we're falling behind. Um, but it's unclear if that's what we're doing or if there's just maybe some uh, I actually think that it's related to the code that we wrote to rebalance connections. 
um, I think that code is just not implemented in with watches. Um, it's it's implemented with periodic gets, and so we need to just enhance that code to to be better. Well, that's that's nice that it's uh, that simple. Hopefully, hopefully. Oh, do we pull the list of nodes just to find out how many nodes there are? Yeah, we, we need to know how many nodes there are to know how many expected connections there should be. Um, so I think I think that's that's probably what's going on there. Do you know how often we just out of curiosity what what our interval is? I do not. But I feel like I remember seeing a like slash slash to do um, fix this so it doesn't just like pull gets. Uh, cool. Thanks, everybody. Um, any other hot issues or topics you wanted to, to bring up in this section? If not, then I have a couple of shout outs I'd like to make in the uh, Calico Hero section. Um, so first, I just wanted to say thanks to uh, Alois Augustine, who um, he was on uh, last week to talk about the Calico VPP integration and has been uh, kind of continuing to, to work with us there. Um, so he submitted that. Uh, PR for the CNI plugin to um, uh, add this this data plane interface. Uh, I think it's really great to to see um, you know him contributing that integration point back upstream uh, so that um, you know, he can take advantage of it with, with his project, but also others might be able to in the in the future. Um, so so that's. Uh, yeah, I was really excited to see that. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to uh, Richard Kovach, who's I think on the call um, for the uh, CIDR conflict detection PR. Um, yeah, and was, this, is, uh, this is Richard's first meeting also. So welcome to the community meeting, Richard. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I think that was a, a very nice uh, quality of life improvement and should solve a lot of uh, a lot of people's troubles with getting started with Calico. I was very happy to, to have that. Uh, does anybody else want to give a quick shout out to to anyone for anything? Yeah, I wanted to give a shout out to Edward Chang, who is one of the new students who has been collaborating with us on um, uh, on some of our on ramps. Uh, he just put together his his first uh, docs request um, there's there's one last little bit that we're gonna fix up but um, this is the first time he's committed to uh, an open source project and um, we're really excited to have him on board and helping us you know find ways that we can improve calico and make it better for all the users who are coming to it so uh, lots of thanks to Edward Chang for sure yeah uh, that's awesome to uh to see the students getting involved. One thing I just to add to the to the Calico Heroes is um, we try and um, send out a little bit of uh, kind of thank you note or, or or swag to people who contributed. But with the current coronavirus situation, um, all our offices are closed, so that program's kind of on hold. Um, but when things get back to normal, uh, we'll we've got a ton of. Uh, swag is quarantined. Swag is quarantined. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, but just a little small, uh, just a token of, of thank you and appreciation for 
you know, all those people out there in the community who are helping make the project successful. Sounds like uh, we need to start thinking of some virtual swag. I'll make another pitch for uh, CaliCoin cryptocurrency. CaliCoin <laughs> cryptocurrency. <laughs> It I'll looks like I'll let you finish that the weekend then. It looks like Tommaso just joined the call also. Um, so, hi Tommaso, and uh, hi, uh, thanks for um, the uh, the VXLAN uh, reporting uh, on the on the Sunday issue. Yeah, we we were really appreciative of that. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Sorry for being late. Um, I had some connection issues. <laughs> No problem. Thanks for coming. Yeah, we, we talked a little bit about that that issue earlier. Uh, we've got some fixes in the works, both for uh, three fourteen and, and some uh, patch releases earlier. Okay, are we ready for a sweet host endpoint demo, Lawrence? Uh, yes, I will give it a go. I am. I seem to be having some difficulties with my cluster at the moment, but uh, but let's let's just do it. Yeah, should be good. Demos that start off with my cluster isn't working properly always go super well. So fingers crossed for you, Lawrence. Yes, uh, you've probably got a good group to help diagnose it if uh, if need be. All right. So I've got. Uh, yeah, so I want to show off the uh, auto host endpoints work that we've been working on um, for 3.14. And so I've got a vanilla Calico cluster out of the box. And um, let's see what happens if I get nodes. So you see a bunch of nodes are there. And if I get um, host endpoints, you see that we don't have any host endpoints. And uh, before I do anything, I'm just going to apply a uh, policy to uh, allow all traffic. Um, so I've got one right here. So, oh, by the way, can you guys see my screen? Okay, font is good. So you can see I've got an allow all on ingress and egress, and I've got a selector, um, you know, just to select on this Kubernetes host point, host name uh, label. So I'm just going to. Um, Apply this. Wow. Well, oh. All right. So if I get um, get my policy, there it is. Okay. So the other thing um, that I want to do is I want to um, show off the cube controls configuration. So Calico Cuddle. So as a part of this work, um, Spike added this new resource to Calico called Cube Controllers Configuration. And you can sort of think of it as kind of like on the same sort of analogous to Felix Configuration. So it's a way to configure Cube Controllers. And if I just show that, actually maybe it's better if I just export this because I need to edit this anyways. So you can see uh, in the spec we've got uh, controllers field and it shows the enabled controllers and some other useful fields. Um, you can see it also shows um, when environment variables were set and also what it's running with. Um, in particular, there's a field here under node um, called host endpoint dot auto create and by default auto host endpoint is disabled. But let's go ahead and edit this and enable it. Oops, no tabs. Right. So I'm gonna save this. Um, and um, just, I'm gonna apply this now. And if all goes well, oh, I must have a tab. Yeah. So, 
again. Fantastic. Okay. Um, and so if I get my host endpoints again, there they are. So actually, let me show the YAML because uh, of one of these, just so it's clear what's going on here. So you can see here's our auto host endpoint. Um, and you can see it's a wildcard host endpoint um, because it's got interface named star. It also has a bunch of fields populated like expected IPs. And these are IPs that are taken from the node. And I'll, um, and I'll show that in a second, but you can see that there's a bunch of labels here um, that were on that node. And if I get that node, Let's see, we've got the same exact labels. For example, I, I added this uh, uh, community calico label from earlier, and you can see that it's, it's up there as well. Great. So when you create, uh, when you enable this feature, um, immediately all of your nodes get this uh, host endpoint created. Um, one thing you can do is you can, um, so as as this as QControllers runs. Um, as nodes get added or removed, or when the node gets updated, the host endpoint gets updated. So if I um, label a node, um, say that same node. Oops. Let's take this one. Label node. Um, demo. Okay. So if I add this label, demo gods is okay to that node. If I get that host endpoint again, I can see that label. Yes, so there it is. Demo. Right. And that if the cube cuttle to label it, does it does it just pick up the Kubernetes labels? Oh yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, that's. That doesn't make sense, obviously, because I've just, uh, um, it should. Yeah, so if I use that, use uh, kubectl to add the label, it'll do the same thing. Because uh, we have the other part of the node controller that syncs over the labels from uh, the Kubernetes node to the Calico node. And this cluster uh, appears to be a, a KDD cluster anyway. So Calico cuddle label node actually ends up just labeling the Kubernetes object. Oh, right. Yes, of course. Um, I was kind of surprised that worked, to be honest. Um, so uh, what's the other thing I want to show? Um, so I guess last thing I can do is just delete one of these nodes. Um, so let's just uh, get to it. I'll delete this one. Node. So I'm going to delete this node from the cluster. And if I get the nodes, you can see um, 101.58 is gone now. And if I get the host endpoints, that is also gone. And if I SSH back into that specific host and um, restart kubelet, here 101.58 is back and let's see if this comes up okay there it is so that's that's auto host endpoints in a nutshell and so you can see auto host endpoints um, features um, managing the life cycle of these host endpoints and if for whatever reason um, you know you've uh, disabled this feature all of the host endpoints will get deleted. Um, I was running into some issues doing that. It was taking quite a bit longer than I expected, but, uh, but it does do that. And it'll also clean up any dangling um, auto host endpoints that are kind of left behind if, you know, um, if it gets into that kind of state. Does anybody have any questions? 
that's all I had planned to show. Unless anyone's got something there for me to uh, try. Just thinking about it from a from a usage point of view, like I'm curious, like is this something that I would want to enable by by default? You know, when it's you know once the feature is out there, or like what what are the advantages of me using this versus um, versus not using it? Like what are the, what what are some of the use cases I might be interested in? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I should probably should have started with that uh, at the beginning. So so one of the things I forgot to mention is that we're planning to. Um, make this feature kind of really easy to use in that you can enable it and it won't block any traffic by default. Um, and we're gonna do that by adding a profile to these other host endpoints um, that allows all traffic. And what that means is as long as you don't have, if you don't have any policy, uh, network policy applying to these uh, hosts, um, then traffic is gonna be unaffected uh, to your cluster. Um, as far as use cases, um, we've heard from a lot of people, uh, a lot of users that they would like to have a way to immediately, like first of all, to automate this because if you've got, you know, say dozens or a hundred or maybe thousands of nodes, it can be a pain to kind of automate this. Um, you'd have to create your own tooling. Um, the other thing is they'd like to have this kind of be enabled, like have a host endpoint created um, at cluster creation, that'd be really nice to have, you know. Um, and if you have policy in place, then traffic to that to those hosts gets enforced. So that's kind of nice. Um, yeah, to take one step back, which is why do you want a host endpoint in the first place? It's so that you can use Calico policy to manage network access to to the host itself. So the hosts are running, you know, Kubelet. Um, they're running. Um, node ports, they're running all kinds of, of things. Maybe they're even running some, some normal workloads that are, that are host uh, networked or, or just being started normally on the node. You wanna protect those um, with Calico firewalls as well. You need a host endpoint in order to do that. Um, and when you have an auto scaling cluster or thousands of nodes, it's, it's a pain to manage those host endpoints. So now we're managing them for you. Cool. Is it how how easy is it for you to lock yourself out of your cluster with this? <laughs> is there is there a way to like is there a oh no switch? <laughs> yeah, so it, it's it's somewhat easy to um, break uh, your node's connectivity to to other things if you're not careful with policy. But we do have fail safes that should um, in in a lot of cases prevent. Uh, the Calico services that are running on that node from losing connection to the data store. So you can, you can sort of unbreak yourself by applying the appropriate policy. Um, so you're, you, you might break yourself, but you're don't, you're not like breaking those, um, uh, those nodes and making them network blind. You can, you can apply the appropriate policy and then things will, will sort themselves out. Cool. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> Yeah, it's very cool. I'm very excited about this feature. Um, I know a lot of people who want to make more use of, of these capabilities. And right now, um, they can't justify writing the tooling for themselves. So us having it fully automated for them is pretty awesome. Yeah, just one last thing I want to say. This, uh, this feature has kind of involved a lot of people. Like a lot of people uh, have been working on it. Neil's been working on this a lot. Uh, with me and Spike has made a, has been a kind of key as, in, as part of this effort and Sean has helped. There's been a lot of, a uh, lot of people took a village to, to kind of get this out or almost out. Casey, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, cool. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, any other questions on, on this? Okay. Uh, in that case, I think we've got a little bit of time in case there's any general Q&A or um, sort of questions that, that folks have for, for any of the maintainers. Lawrence, you're still sharing your screen. 
that too. Seen some slacks. Thanks. Yeah, nothing is off limits, uh, especially uh, Richard and Tomasa, if you have any questions, <laughs> it's a great time to ask. Everybody got their uh, home offices optimized at this point. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any question now. Uh, I closed my last issue and I, I'm looking for a new, new one for a new joiner friend, friendly one. But as I imagine the, the currently issues labeled with that are bird related and need some C programming skills, which I don't have. Uh, uh, which ones are those? Uh, let me see. Maybe we should do a, a review of those. <laughs> The, yes, the label. Like good, for, good first issue is the label. Yeah. And uh, as I check those are all, only C issues. Yeah, it's possible that we need to go through and uh, yes, would update be nice. those a little bit. But um, you should reach out to us on Slack too. We can can help guide you for something that you're interested in and is a good fit. All right, I'm interested in all part of Calico, so <laughs> I just want to learn it more and more. And uh, currently I'm working for IBM as a Kubernetes network engineer. And uh, I asked for some spare time to work on, on some open source project because life without open source is not live, <laughs> exactly. So I have some some time to, to work on, firstly, some easy issues. Awesome, that's that's great to hear. Any suggestions, welcome. Yeah, let's do, um, so, so reach out on Slack and um, let's also try and just do a, another grooming session uh, amongst the, some of the maintainers to identify some more good first time issues as well. Yeah, Eric and, and Raphael, we should make sure that that's on our radar when we're doing our, our sweep um, to think about which, which issues might be good first ones. It's something I haven't uh, been thinking about en enough, I know. Yeah. I usually not on my mind either. Any more for any more? Um, I have I have something on my mind. Um, I don't know if it is. I haven't decided how to action on it yet. Um, but in the last few weeks, I've, I've seen at least three people running CentOS kind of running into trouble getting uh, Calico stood up with the Kubernetes cluster, both on CentOS 7 and 8. So I might start digging in a little bit to figure out if there's a real issue there <laughs> or if it's, or if it's uh, something else that's happening in, inside of the user environments. Um, but it feels like they're, it may, they're maybe a little, there may be a little, uh, where the kind of following where, where there's smoke, there's fire principle. <laughs> but did, do you remember any any details about what what they were running into? Um, uh, one of them isn't able to. Uh, they they can't bring their calico uh, pods up um, until they turn off IP tables. Um, in another instance, they're in a. In a, in a, in a multi-master installation, um, the uh, um, tiller can't see the master node, um, and it looks like it's that network connectivity is being blocked. Um, 
And a third one, it looked like it was misconfiguration of Docker. So I don't think that that's related to, to us. But off the top of my head, those are the, those are the things that people have been reporting. Um, so it's, it, again, I don't have anything deeper to say about it, but um, it's, it's something I've been noticing over the last uh, few weeks. I think Eric uh, added auto detection for IP tables mode in a recent version. So if someone's running on a, a recent CentOS that has NFT IP tables enabled, they also need to run a recent Calico so that we ought to detect that. Is um, auto detect turn on, turned on by, by default? I was looking through that, that, that setting and it looked like it still defaults to legacy. Don't know. <laughs> okay. We should fix that. <laughs> Yeah, but that was, uh, but yeah, but on, on one of the issues, I, I thought that would be it, but it turns out that they were running CentOS 7, so they were running, um, you know, IP tables, not, a, not NFT. Yeah, we should definitely default to the auto detection if, uh, if we're not already, because otherwise it's not, uh, not adding a whole lot of value. Yeah, I was look, I was looking at the recent documentation, and and my my recollection from the recent documentation is that is that it defaults to legacy. One thing you have to be a little careful of is Felix has a default, but then we sometimes override the default in the manifests for specific environments. So the <laughs> the, the apparent default when you install it is the combination of whatever Felix's default is with any overrides we've set. For the particular uh, Calico YAML that you're using, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. anyway. which is, is a little bit sad, but we we override things for for the benefit of people who are using that manifest. So yeah, yeah, I, no I noticed that. But anyway, yeah, um, you know, and I just brought it up because it bubbled up on the discourse this morning too. So it's just like you know, it was like you know, right there on the front of my mind. So. Yeah, I don't want to discourage you from doing a deep dive on, on CentOS, but I mean, it is a very popular operating system. So it could be a coincidence that lots of people are seeing issues. <laughs> it, could, it, could it. Be, it could be a coincidence. As a, as a CentOS user, it's just, you know, CentOS. <laughs> yeah. That's what we really need. We need some, some people in the community who are like keen CentOS users, because I think most of us run Ubuntu or Arch or something. Yeah, I was uh, I I I I administered a CentOS or Red Hat cluster, but you know, starting on CentOS, running OpenStack many years ago. So yeah, I've always like been partial to CentOS as, as my operating system, but more and more in the open source world, I've been finding myself pushed to Ubuntu just because there's there's wider adoption of it amongst a lot of different projects. Sean, did you say most of us run Ubuntu or Arch? I think, well, I, I'm aware of one or two people who run Arch, mm -hmm. but I, I run Ubuntu. I thought most of you guys did as well. Me. Yeah. Is it just Matt who runs Arch? Maybe. Yeah, you may uh, have your idea of the distribution skewed by who you're talking to. No, no, he's been talking it up in the Vancouver office uh, in the past. So I've been considering it too. I've just, I've had some issues with Ubuntu lately. So Arch is probably the next. Yeah, you can switch to Arch and then you can have lots of issues. <laughs> That's <true>. I, <laughs> people who run Arch, they're either running Arch or Arch is broken and they're telling you how good it is while <laughs> it like reinstalls or something. Yeah, I'm I'm doing Linux from scratch. Just build everything from source. Just you know, use my time, spend my time well. I thought everyone was running those secure Linux distros these days. C containerized VI. That's one thing that has tripped us up on Red Hat and CentOS before. They tend to lock things down a little bit more, so. We can easily run afoul of that if there's some setting that's been 
uh, lockdown that we're not expecting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it is it is one of our target um, uh, target uh, OSs, and we do um, we do run at least some tests on it. I think certainly like uh, our OpenShift tests and so on should well I don't, can't think they could be running on anything else. Yeah, that's the thing is like we're running, you know, I don't know if is OpenShift running mainly on Red Hat Enterprise or have they have they moved it to whatever they're calling um, Core OS these days? Yeah, I thought it was on the lightweight what container OS. Yes. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, the the base OS is is something you can configure. So you can have you can even have some nodes that are running like RHEL eight, some that are running RHEL seven, some that are running one of their other like put down OS is like there's there's lots of options in OpenShift. It's uh, it's a very hard thing to target because it has configurability at every level. And if you buy from IBM, we use a uh, Red Hat. I was just remembering years ago, I, I flew into the US and uh, I got randomly selected for inspection uh, at customs and um, the officer asked me to turn my laptop on and Grub comes on and there's like <laughs> 20 different options. Uh, and he just looks at me and goes, you're fine. I don't know what he was looking for. <laughs> He was hoping it was going to be Windows. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any more last minute topics or questions? Any more OS banter? OS banter, of course. Oh, man. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not actually <laughs> get Raphael started. <laughs> I also wanted to talk about um, our Emacs integrations. <laughs> uh, Neil's not here. <laughs> he probably has a handful for you. <laughs> yeah, Sean knows. All right. Uh, in that case, I think we will meet again in two weeks. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks everybody. Yeah, no, not two weeks, keep sorry. Going. It's uh it's the second week of every month, yeah. so it's it's uh four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Bye. Stay safe guys.